Let's pray. Father, we say thank you for the certainty of the promise that in your arms, in your hand, 10,000, 10,000 of 10,000 charms, graces, blessings and beauties, treasures. You're full of goodness and you promise that's, that's who you are, it's what you have for us. You will embrace us in your arms. It's to that kind of a God that we are bid to come. Thank you, thank you that you do not work from sternness and law. Come or else, you say, come and find. You are a God who is gracious and generous. And I pray now that you would move us, that you would take this passage before us this morning, that you would move us to run to you, to come eager, to come quickly, to come expectantly. Draw near and stay close. Move your people in that direction this morning because of this passage here, Lord. Would you make it clear to us? Would you teach us, guide us, and build us up to do us good and to bring honor to your name as the gracious and generous one? Thank you, Lord. Speak now, we pray. Amen. Up to this point in the book of Jude, we have been hearing a lot about false teachers inside the church, among us, trying to sell a new and improved version of the faith in place of the true Christian message, once and for all delivered by Jesus and his apostles. And whether the alternative faith that they're, they're selling is exactly like what Jude was talking about in verse 4 or some version of that, we're always going to be bumping into that. It, it is around us, and the point is clear. Such teachers are ungodly people. Woe to them. This was last week, verses 11 to 16. Woe to them, it says, for the Lord is coming in judgment to deliver them to the utter darkness for which they are even now being kept. And at that word kept, which is literally present there right at the end of verse 13. From right there, last week towards the end of the sermon, I, I wanted to kind of figuratively draw a line from 13 back to verse 1 where we see the word kept again used in a different, much more favorable context. Not the ungodly kept for destruction, but God's called beloved ones kept for Jesus Christ. Right there, that's the faithful Christian the believer, kept by God the Father for everlasting fellowship with God the Son. That's our identity. If you're Christian, that's your identity. And that's a good word for us. But as we see this morning, it's not the final word for us, nor in fact is it the final use of the word kept in this book. Jude uses it a third time this morning in our passage, verses 17 to 23. He's about to leave behind this discussion, this, this kind of negative and very heated discussion of these false teachers and shift his focus back directly onto us, the beloved ones, those kept for Christ. He's going to tell us how we are to conduct ourselves and treat others in the church given the presence of all the false teachers and all the false teaching that's here inside the camp. So that, that's here. What are we to do? That's our passage this morning. We're going to look at that, drawing out three observations from the passage, but I'm first going to read it. This is beginning in verse 17. I'm going to read down through verse 23. Then three observations, the first of which is pretty short. So follow along as I read verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. 
and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Jude, verses 17 to 23. So three observations. Here's the first. Remember, this situation is supposed to be our constant context in the final days. Remember, this situation is supposed to be our constant context in the final days. 17 is coming back around to direct, directly address the church, and it contains a command that is sort of a summary of the warning he launched into back in verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, he talked about certain people who long ago were designated, that is by God's plan, designated for this condemnation. And then five and on, he said, let me tell you what that condemnation looks like, what it's always looked like. And now verse 17, he sort of says, now, just to summarize this and wrap it all up, that's kind of how this flows here. Told you what he was going to say, said it, now it's telling you what he said. Beloved, the apostles of our Lord predicted this. And the grammar makes clear, not just one apostle once, but all of them constantly. It was a theme of what they talked about. We live at the end of redemption history. The very next thing to happen is what verse 14 talked about, the, the coming of Christ and the judgment. So we live in the last time, and during that last period of time, right before the end, there will be scoffers. Scoffers who follow their own ungodly passions. They mock the Christian, Christian faith, they mock Christian standards, and instead, for whatever reason, it appeals to them physically. Other people around them say it should be so. And so they, they, they move towards, they uphold what they are inclined towards. Not what God has taught, what they are inclined towards. What they feel best in their own eyes should be. It's especially common in, in sensual or sexual standards, moral standards. But whatever it is, it's exactly what these folks that Jude's been describing are like. He's been warning us about them. Many are like that today. We expect it. We should expect it outside the church. But he's been saying, and he reminds us again, that's actually inside the church too. These are people who, who are, verse 19, causing division, worldly, operating according to their own flesh. They do not have the spirit. They're not Christians. But they're in the church. Now, in some ways, like I said, he said that a bunch of times already. This is kind of a summary, kind of pulling it all together. But there's an interesting and subtle point here in this summary, the heart of this first observation. He says, so remember, that's for real the situation and then says nothing at all about getting rid of it. Nothing at all about eliminating the problem they present. At least not now. They're here among us, and here they remain, by God's design. We were told this. This is our constant context. And as such, it very much resembles Jesus' parable of the weeds in Matthew 13. Maybe you remember that. Jesus told a story about a farmer who was representing God who planted wheat in a field. Good wheat. And then along came an enemy who also planted weeds in the very same field. And the farmer, got the God character, like Jude here, says that the plan is just to leave them there to not do anything about it, but just to leave them there until the time of harvest when it will all get sorted out. So don't be alarmed or disdained by the presence of falsehood in the church. God's not. It's part of his plan. If we were to ask, like, why would that be? Well, he doesn't say, but there, there are reasons we can imagine. There's certainly a testing of our faith. It certainly challenges us and causes us to be alert and on guard and that, that grows us. There, there could be reasons, but he doesn't say. He just says this is. 
And certainly in other places, we are commanded to avoid false teaching and do what we can to not set up false teaching, for sure. But here, very simply, the point is, we're never going to get it all cleared out. And he doesn't tell us anything to do even to try. Instead, Jude spends all his energy and directs our attention then onto ourselves and others in the church who may be drawn on, tempted. The cabin is losing pressure. You can't fix the hole in the cabin. Put on a mask and then help somebody else. And that takes us to our second and third observations. Here's the second observation. Keep yourselves in the love of God, beloved. This is our main focus here this morning. So kind of settle into this and, and like hear it. I think this is really, this is sweet, I think. As, as I kind of like dwell on this, it's kind of like good. So sit in it for a second. Keep yourselves in the love of God, beloved. That comes from verse 20. It introduces the, the second main statement of the passage. And depending on which translation you're reading, English translation, you may notice that 20 and 21 are really one big long sentence. One sentence. And the grammar in that sentence is clear. There is one main verb, a command. Keep yourselves. And then there are three other supporting verbs that in ways help us with the keeping. You could write them, as some translations do, with ing after them. Building, praying, in verse 21, waiting. That would be a good way to write them. But because there are things that we're also exhorted to do, some translations write them as commands. It doesn't matter which way they're written as long as you understand. There's one main verb and then supporting verbs. So the main thread of the sentence is, but you, beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. There are going to be, be reminded, there are going to be all kinds of false teachers and all kinds of falsehoods circling all around right next to you. That's our constant context. That's Jude's point. Surely that's true for us today. I mean, most of us in our pockets have a phone and the feed on your various apps on your phone pushes false teaching to you every moment. pushes, feeds you false teaching. Apart from getting rid of your phone and all your other devices, you can't stop that. And you can't stop that in your friend's pocket either. That's going to keep coming at us. It, 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 is our context, it is our context constantly. So his point is, tend to yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Which is a sweet statement, but it may seem kind of odd given how much we've already said about how God keeps us and how we are beloved. And that's from verses one and two. That's our identity, sweetly true of us. He even calls us that again here a couple times. We are his beloved. That is the case by God's choice and action. So, what does it mean that I'm supposed to work to maintain that? How does that fit together? Well, it doesn't mean that a true Christian, a beloved one, might somehow mess up and become no longer a true Christian, no longer a beloved one. A true Christian can't lose her salvation. God saves, not us, and God keeps us saved, not us. That's not only from a bunch of places in the Bible, not only from verses 1 and 2, it's also from verse 24, which we're going to look at next week. God's the one who keeps a Christian. That verse is going to tell us he, he's the one who keeps us from finally fully stumbling. and He presents us before Christ blameless when he comes. So God keeps Christians, Christians. God keeps Christians for Christ, like verse, two, like verse 1 said. But the point Jude is making here is about how God does that. How God keeps us. So you have to think about this a little bit. 
God keeps us by moving us to take needed action. And we do have to take the needed action. By moving Christians to draw near to Christ, when told that they have to, when told that that's God's call on us, and when told that that's where God's blessings lie, it's his love, not just his commands, his draw near to keep his, in his love. That's where his blessings lie. That's how we're kept and kept safe. The, the new creation that is a Christian, we are different. There's something in us now that he has given us ears to hear that. We, we hear that command and we respond to it. Not perfectly, not sinlessly, not always immediately, not always in ways that mean God never disciplines us. So not perfectly, but truly so, that command resonates with a spirit-indwelt Christian. That's why God gives it. It's like a father with a small, mobile child on a walk. Dad says, here, hold my hand. That's a command to the child. And the child has to respond. Right? But that's all the doing of the father. The father's the one that that sees that the child's in danger, sees what would keep the child safe, calls for her hand, and because, given who she is by his creation, given the heart that's in her to to naturally hear her dad's voice and naturally be inclined to trust it, she'll respond knowing that it's a good thing. She just needs to be told what to do and made able to do it. And then in obedience and faith, maybe driven by some fear, she looks around at the traffic, zipping by her, maybe, maybe there's some fear involved there. But in confidence, in his hand, she responds, and the needed hand-to-hand connection is established and kept. Not by her power holding onto his hand, his hand holds onto hers. If you're a parent and you've done this, you know. The kid's hand is present, you're holding it. That's like God with his people. Right here in Jude. Beloved, there are dangers all around you and there always will be. Here, hold my hand. But just to clarify and to further entice you, to clarify and further entice you, entice you, This could sound like, here, hold my hand right now. And I've spoken to my kids like that sometimes when the kids like this head towards the street, right? Here, now. But what I I want to do usually and what God means to entice you with is to say, "Let let me clarify. When I say hold my hand, what I'm saying is, Jump into the river of gracious love and soak it in and stay there. To grab hold of me and to keep my hand, really what I mean is keep yourselves in the love of God. Come over here, step into a flowing river of gracious, merciful, good kindness. Would you please reach out your hand and grab a hold of wise, omnipotent, careful, curious, beautiful grace and mercy, blessing, treasure. Here, take a hold of that. He's trying to entice you, to lure you, not to command you, to lure you. Hey, come on over here. Take a hold of and keep in my love. What I'm really trying to say is I know, 
I, I am well aware, child, that everyone else out there in the world, nobody in the world commands you to come over to them. Everybody in the world tries to entice you. Hey, come on over here. Come over and swim in this river. Come take fruit off of this tree. Come look to these clouds for water. Come into the far country. Live it up. They're luring you. Okay, I can lure. Let me tell you about luring. I can entice. Let me show you who I am. Let me tell you what I give to you. Not by command, but by blessing. I'm a God of grace. I'm the generous one. I created all goodness. It's, it's what defines me. In fact, it's good because I define it. And I promise you, promise you, swear on Christ's empty tomb that I'm a God who is generous and good. I know how to love, and I love you wide, long, high, deep, just like I loved my son. In him, I'm for you. In him, come to me, grab a hold of me, and find mercy and peace and love multiplied to you, verse 2. That's what I have for you. Come on, come on, come on. Come here, find it, stick close. Take my hand. He's luring and enticing you. I know you'll be tempted. It'll seem and feel good. It'll appeal to your flesh, but there's a hook in it. It's poison. Buyer, beware. It can't deliver except to condemnation. It's empty and fruitless, but I'm the God of love. Come to me. Are you weary and heavy laden? Do you want that? Come to me. Come, come, come. Take my hand. That's the God who is. Beloved Christian, that's the God who is yours who's talking to you and pleading with you and trying to entice you constantly. Come. So put yourself in the place where the love of God for you is felt and experienced and multiplied and seen. It'll inoculate you against all the false offers of the world. He's the God of great and glorious enticement. He's the God of love. He's the God who is good. That's who he is. How do you know that? Surely somebody will... Yeah, that's what he says. He only says that to entrap you. Somebody will whisper that in your ear. How do you know that's false? Would God have sent his own son to go to the cross, crucified him to pay for sin, buried him in the grave, shunned, raised him up accepted, raised him up to heaven to reign so that he could rip you off, enslave you, ruin your life. Not likely. Your life was already ruined, not just because of the condemnation of God that's coming, but because of the wreckage that is the world. That's all you had. Look around at the wreckage of the world. That's all you had. And God stepped in to save you. That's why you should say, I think you're telling me the truth when you say come and find love and stay in it. And I think they are deceiving me when they say there's an alternative that's better. It isn't. It's a lie. Beloved, come and put yourself in the place where the love of God is felt and experienced and multiplied and seen. And so then somebody says, okay, how do I do that? Because I can understand the physical image of take a hand, but this is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. So what does that exactly mean? And that's where the supporting verbs come in helpful. It gives some, I think, pretty clear and practical advice. Verse 20, first. First one, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. That is, building up, growing getting stronger in, strengthening your most holy faith. Not the kind of faith these guys offer, but the true one. The one from God, the holy one. So we could just rewrite that first statement. We could write it as a command because it is something that we're supposed to do. Grow in your dependence 
on the God of the Bible and his work. His nature, his promises, what he's done in Christ. Grow in dependence on the God of the Bible and his work. So, of course, get stronger in your knowledge of the message, the faith. No, you've got to know the character of God and what he's done in Christ and know those things. But also notice it says your faith, not just the faith. What he's implying there is that this is personalized in some way now. It's not like an abstract body of truth out there. It's mine. So we need to think about growing in my grasping of that, in my trusting of it, in my depending on it. So, put it like this. Make choices to live depending on God, not by sight. Make choices to believe that what God says is true, not what other people say. Make choices to believe that he will meet you with grace on the other side of obedience. Believe that. Therefore, you say no to temptations, no to feelings. Those are choices that we have to make in the moments of of evaluation, no and yes. You have to build the faith muscle. And it is always... Better done together with others, with 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 and among the body. We grow in our faith better when we speak the truth to one another, when we point out lies and errors and temptations to one another, and we remind one another of God's promises of grace. A whole bunch of falling down, the opposite of building up. A whole bunch of falling down happens in isolation. By oneself. Building up in your faith. It's the first verb. And praying in the Holy Spirit. The second one. This emphasizes less the sort of prayer that would be like making particular requests. That would be included, of course. But it's less emphasizing that. And more the main idea is spiritual communion with God. Sometimes we might call that something like a quiet time. Some language is used sometimes, quiet time. But don't think it's only talking about like you with your Bible in a room all by yourself in your house. It, it could be you with music in your ears as you're on a trail. It, it could be anything in which you are careful to kind of set aside the world and attend to God. And for most of us, most of us have a work, a work week that is full of other stuff and should realize that's why God made the Sabbath. For you. He didn't make us for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for us to give you a spot in your week in which you could say, now I can particularly attend to God. Not that you never do else other times, but you can particularly attend to him today. So you interact with him. You, you set aside the world in some way, and in, in a unique way, you pull the truth of the scripture to your, the front of your eyes, and you engage with God over it. You talk to him. You ask of him. You confess to him. You, you share with him what concerns you. And as some of the old Puritans used to say, you pray until you pray. This is for me, at least, the first X number of minutes of doing that is just me talking to the wall. And then somewhere in there, God shows up. And you got to pray until that point when God says, here I am. And you begin to commune with him. And the Spirit then, in a unique way, takes your mind and your heart and shows up. Filled with the Spirit, you're 
You're in a different place, and all those things you were reading now kind of pop off the page, and you say, yes, he is real. Yes, he is good. There's no formula that makes that happen. You just go to God and say, Lord, here I am. Speak. Praying in the Holy Spirit, communing with God spiritually. And that that may lead to something remarkably supernatural. It may lead to something that's full of tears. Puritans also used to talk about the gift of tears that comes once you're praying. Tears come in both sorrowful and joyful settings. Ironically, both settings. So sometimes what we're looking for is to say, I want to put my emotions in front of you, God. That can be hard for some of us. I want to put my emotions in front of you and let you have me over this truth. And maybe that leads to tears. Maybe it leads to something else. But what it leads to is you communing with God, praying in the Spirit. So making choices to learn about God and trust him, growing in the faith. Praying under the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit. That's what you do to reach out your hand to God, to keep yourself in his love, because what's going to happen there in both of those situations is God's going to show up and show you, I'm trustworthy, I'm good, I'm real, and I'm present. You're going to meet him. And the God who is love will show himself to you. And you do that always in the context of waiting for the mercy that is to come. The third verb. We are right now objects of mercy. Verse 2 remind us of that. We live in mercy every moment. But we also need to wait for mercy that is coming yet. When the Lord Jesus, who ascended, is waiting, when he comes back, what's going to happen? We saw it last week. Judgment. And when I stand, when you stand before the judge, what's going to happen? Back to back here. What's going to happen first is guilty as charged. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Guilty as charged. And the very next word is mercy as promised. Guilty as charged and mercy as promised. I've taken that and I've put it on Christ. It's the mercy that leads to eternal life. That's coming for us. You stand before the sovereign and holy one and you expect, by his word, you expect mercy The condemnation is not going to fall on you and instead you will be ushered into eternal life. That moment is coming and we must always, if you want to take God's hand and hold it and abide in his love, that moment must live as present tense in your mind. Part of the lure of the the alternative loves, part of the offer that draws us on is, is tied to the forgetting that there is ever going to be a reckoning. God wants to remind us of that, bring it up close and say, I'm the God of love, I'm the God who's good, I'm the God who's given you so much and will give you so much, but no greater love is anyone than this, that I gave my son for you, so that at that moment when the judgment happens, you're going to hear mercy. That's the greatest evidence of the love of God for you. And it is deep and profound and real. The tomb was empty for you. We must see and realize the depth of our sin and see and realize the surpassing depth of God's mercy for us. This is our, this is your destiny. We live, we're called to live holding God's hand, staying, remaining in, holding tight to his love. And he tells us in three ways how we go about doing that. Would you grow in exercising your faith? You'll find me faithful. Would you commune with me personally? You'll find me sweet and good. And you were, will you remember the judgment that's coming and the mercy I'm giving you? 
you'll find me a savior, sweet and kind. Live on those things. Feed your mind with those things. Keep yourselves in the love of God for you. And as you keep yourself in that spot and experience God's love for you and realize the mercy that is yours now and the mercy that is coming, what then God expects is that mercy to us will be mercy coming out from us, which is the third point. The final observation, show mercy to save others. Show mercy to save others. Verses 22 and 23 turn to a third group now, not the false teachers and not us exactly, the faithful Christian, but rather those in the church who are somewhere in between. And given that it's the in-between, there's going to be a spread to that. There's going to be a, a spectrum there. Somewhere between actively spreading falsehood and actively resisting it, there's going to be some people who are kind of wondering, I don't, I'm not really sure what's true here. I'm kind of unclear. Or that does seem enticing, but so does this. There's going to be some in between. You can be confused. And the point here, what Jude's writing about, what he, what he wants to see come out of us, is mercy. Now, there are three statements here that are probably not meant to represent three distinct groups. It's probably just recognizing that this is kind of a hodgepodge here in the middle. So there are some who doubt. Show them mercy. Compassionate and tender and gracious and patient. Show them mercy. I think some people, when they come to this spot, are a little bit surprised by that because given how much heat there has been in the book up to this point, you maybe kind of expect a hard line. You maybe kind of expect, and the person who's like glancing out the window and maybe inclined to go over that would say, <laughs> snap them back. You maybe expect that, given kind of how the book feels. And I think also that that is a rather common response in the church. Maybe we feel threatened by questioning. We feel threatened by doubting. We feel threatened by wandering. Particularly if they are friends of ours or kids of us, we feel indicted by it. So we want to stop it. No. Which usually tends to just suppress it and make it go undercover. It doesn't drive it away. It just drives it out of, out of our sight. That's, I think, how some have tended to go. And maybe today the other direction that people are tend tending to go is just say, well, it's all okay. We'll just accept it all. We're supposed to love people, I think. And so this is the church and we want to be nice. So whatever you think, come on in. It's okay. That's not what he means. Show mercy. Be compassionate and gracious and kind and careful. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. We're merciful towards a goal because we recognize there's a fire and people are in danger. It is not that everything is okay. Everything that he said with all the heat up above is true. They are wrong, and they are headed towards condemnation, and every, every lure, every enticement has a hook in it. If you go follow them, you're in trouble. It's mercy towards the goal of snatching some out of the fire. And 22 and 23 are, are drawn from a, an interesting image in Zechariah. Chapter 3 in Zechariah has an image of a prophet snatching the high priest like a brand out of the fire, a stick out of the fire. 
and his garments are, are stained with sin and they smell like smoke, but he is saved. That's the image that he's working on here in these, these couple of verses. He's mercifully, he's ur- urging us to be merciful in our approach, but to recognize that somebody has to be snatched out, but we're dealing with fire, so be careful. Do so with fear. Show mercy with fear. So we're working right on the edge of a precipice to switch the image. You don't want to be drowned by the one you tried to save. Watch out, it could happen. There's a whole bunch of power in the power of persuasion. And if you step into a context to save somebody, sometimes you can be accidentally persuaded by what they say, drawn in. So with fear, carefully, in mercy, Snatch them out, recognizing even the danger of the stained garment, that there is a lot of danger here. There's, there's fire. That's all a part of God's mercy towards that person. Our approach, our attempt to save them, to draw them back. Now, he does not tell us anything about technique here. Just goal and attitude. And we would have to say that elsewhere in the Bible, we we recognize that somewhere down the line here, the people who are in the middle cross over the line of no longer in the middle and on one side. Like that's possible, that that someone might move into the the hardened position, the resistant position, the, the spreading of the falsehood position. In which case, we would be called by the Bible elsewhere to set them outside of the church. But before that, he doesn't say anything about how. He just says what? In mercy, snatching them back. So he's addressing our attitude and our goal. And he tells us this goal and this attitude because that's exactly his goal and his attitude towards them. This is the God of mercy that we're talking about who was merciful towards us who snatched you out of the fire. You were not just harassed and helpless. You were a rebel running. And God in mercy said, I come near and I grab you. And then he deploys you on the same mission. So we look around here and and in the midst of us, there, there will always be false teaching. There will be some false teachers here and there. That's our constant context And what we do in that is we spend less time actually trying to get rid of them. That's a hopeless endeavor. And more time tending to ourselves to grab hold of Christ and enjoy who he is in his love and his mercy towards us. And then being his agents of love and mercy towards others, we attempt to persuade everyone around us, come grab the Father's hand. That's where life is found. Come on. For the sake of helping them to re-grip their faith, the faith once and for all delivered to us, the faith in which we find life. Know that there is evil. Tend to yourself. Be merciful to save others. Let me pray. Father, would you help us to be a church like this? a people together who are aware of our context but are in hot pursuit of you, certain that you will welcome us and that in your arms there are 10,000 blessings. Make us a people who are wise and careful, caring, merciful servants towards others too. Lord, build your church and use us. Thank you. Amen.